Okay, so our next speaker is Fiona McEwen, uh, changing tack on subjects now. Fiona graduated from the University of Edinburgh in 2001 with a degree in veterinary medicine and surgery and neuroscience, and then she worked for the PDSA for a couple of years. She gained an MSc in social genetic and development psychiatry and a PhD in psychology from King's College in London. Her research interests include social development in children and adults uh, with and without autism, mapping risk pathways to autism in tuberous sclerosis, from genes to cognition and behaviour, testing diagnostic protocols for autism, the relationship between animal cruelty, child maltreatment and domestic violence, and the moral and ethical issues surrounding animal research. Fiona's going to look at when does a shelter become a hoard, the psychological factors in animal hoarding. I think if I get this definition right, I'll be good. Uh, animal hoarding is the keeping of animals in multiple numbers whilst failing to provide minimal standards of care and not recognising that failure to provide and obsessively attempting to maintain or even increase those numbers. What factors contribute to this phenomena? Is there a particular type of person who engages in this ultimately misguided behaviour? And are there life experiences of that individual that we can recognise as predictors in development of that behaviour? So we're going to, Fiona's going to discuss the different types of animal hoarding, the drivers behind them, the attachments that people have with the animals that they hoard, and suggests that collecting of animals is a symptom of a wider condition that maybe requires the involvement and understanding of mental health professionals and the wider network of adult social services. So, thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Um, so, I'll just outline uh, what I want to cover today. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is introduce you to the Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium, um, which is a, a US group who have been responsible for most of the research in this area. There's a very limited amount of research in this area, but this one group have done an, an awful lot of it. Um, I'm going to give a bit of background and definition of animal hoarding, um, explain why I think understanding psychological factors is really important in these cases, um, talk about the cost of animal hoarding, and then start to think about who are animal hoarders and present an initial typology and why do people hoard animals and present a developmental model of animal hoarding um, and then just briefly talk about intervention and implications that this might have for practice. So the Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium uh, described themselves on their website as a group of researchers who collaborated from 97 to 2006 to define and better understand the problem of animal hoarding. We've assembled the resources on this site to increase awareness about a complex disorder which has until recently not received serious attention by medical, mental health and public health professionals. Um, and I, it's an excellent website, so if you are interested in these types of cases or deal with these types of cases, I would really recommend having a look at this site. Um, another thing they've done is produce a manual for people who are dealing with animal hoarding cases and despite the fact it's been written from a US perspective there's still an awful lot of useful information there and that can be downloaded from the website and it's, I think very useful. So before 1981 there was no formal recognition of the syndrome which meant there was no systematic reporting of cases. In 1981, the first paper appeared in the scientific literature which described a, a series of cases of animal hoarding in New York. And it was apparent, even uh, with this early research, that this wasn't just an issue of animal welfare, but there was a psychological component which was really important to consider. And I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from the abstract of that paper which sort of illustrates that. Multiple owners often prove unable to dispose of new litters even when appropriate homes are available. This difficulty may reflect the subject's imagined parental role towards his animals. Owners often find reason for refusing adoption or they retrieved animals from adoptive homes, asserting that the new owners had failed to provide the animals with their favourite foods. Sometimes they objected to their doctors' marital status, sexual preference or race and even alleged cruel treatment. Intense personalisation of animals was exemplified in different forms of anthropomorphism. One woman kept scrapbooks of animals' lives, celebrated their birthdays and anniversaries and conducted special burials for them. Another elderly woman, unable to bear separation from her dead cats, eviscerated them and dried them out on her fire escape. The cat boards were kept in cupboards throughout her apartment. One owner preserved the animals by stuffing them. So it's sort of apparent that there's obviously a very sort of unusual and problematic relationship between these owners and their, their pets. In um, 1999, um, the, there was a paper published that had the first sort of formal definition of animal hoarding um, and described a, another series of cases, and the same author, sort of reflecting back, um, later said it was clear from these early reports that animal hoarding was not just about pet keeping or sheltering gone awry, since extreme animal suffering in conjunction with strong attachment was inconsistent with all previously described theoretical notions about the human-animal bond. And this is an important factor in these cases, that these are often people who profess to, to love their 
animals are very strongly attached to them, but that coexists with um, you know, really profound suffering, and they, they don't seem to recognise that. Since then, there's been a small number of papers published, but mostly from the US, but there's one recent study from Australia. But importantly, there's no research that's been conducted in the UK. So we, we don't quite know if the situation here is exactly the same. The RSPCA have recently begun to monitor cases in the UK, so you know, hopefully that can be the start of, of more of a research effort here. So what is animal hoarding? Um, as we just heard a little bit, um, it's accumulation of large or more than typical number of animals um, and a failure to provide minimal standards of sanitation, space, nutrition and veterinary care for the animals. So someone who has a lot of animals but actually manages to, to maintain basic standards wouldn't come under this definition. There's also an inability to recognise the effects of this failure on the welfare of the animals, human members of the household and the environment obsessive attempts to accumulate or maintain a collection of animals in the face of progressively deteriorating conditions, and denial or minimisation of problems and living conditions for people and animals. So why do we need to understand the psychological factors? Removing animals or prosecution um, does not address the human mental health component of hoarding, so it addresses the animal welfare component, but, but not the human mental health component. Um, if the mental health component is not addressed, then recidivism is close to 100%, at least as far as um, American reports are concerned. Um, so you know, if you, you can resolve the situation in a particular case by removing the animals, but if that same person then just ups and moves to a new area, starts collecting animals again, then you've not really solved that problem. And that's going to result in further compromises to human and animal welfare. So the cost of animal hoarding, I imagine most people here would be initially coming at this from an animal welfare perspective, and the cost of animals are fairly apparent, that it's ill health, contagious diseases, and euthanasia is often the only option. There's also um, financial costs. Um, US reports have said that the cost can run into tens of thousands of dollars per case. Um, this is because you need veterinary services for large numbers of animals that are often in very poor condition. Um, the housing of those large numbers of animals, the cost of litigation, and also dealing with dwellings, so they may be condemned as unfit for human habitation, um, and there's the cost of cleaning up those um, houses and in some cases demolishing them. But there's also a cost to the humans involved, and you, know, you can sometimes forget that if you just approach it as an animal welfare problem, that these are adults who are often very vulnerable, um, that they are um, showing severe self-neglect and, and living in extreme squalor. There may be children or vulnerable adults in the household as well. And there's also a risk of zoonotic diseases, both to people in the household, but also to others that they're in contact with. So just to sort of illustrate this, so we're not just in talking about the abstract, I'm going to just read out a couple of little, a few sections from a, a case report um, uh, recently reported by the RSPCA. A couple with five children who kept 56 large dogs together with cats, birds and chinchillas in their four-bedroom council house were banned from owning animals for eight years. When RSPCA inspector Amanda Swift attended the property, she was immediately hit by an overpowering smell which made it difficult to breathe. As the door was opened, she was swamped by a sea of dogs, jumping over each other and barking wildly. They were totally out of control. Every room was full of furniture piled high on top of each other, making it difficult to enter some of the rooms. Dog leads were tied to various pieces of furniture, including one tied to a stair lift halfway up the stairs. In the bathroom, there were three cats in cat boxes being kept there permanently for years. Husky puppies were often found in cages with faeces littered on newspaper and had a coccidiosis infection. Six parakeets were being kept in an upstairs bedroom in dirty conditions. One of their children, just nine months old, was in a bed whose sheets were soiled with bird droppings. The man told the vet he had rescued the dogs, mostly from people who did not want them anymore. Many of the animals were suffering from complaints affecting their eyes, teeth, ears and skin, some of them for up to a year. A total of 64 animals were removed to the RSPCA's animal centre, where a number of volunteers were called in to help care for all of the dogs. The majority of the dogs were significantly underweight, suffering from matted, dirty coats, and some had ear infections. The court heard that the RSPCA spent a total of £7,400 on investigations, vet bills and legal costs. The animals were all signed into RSPCA care, and the vast majority have now been rehomed. So we hear a lot, we get a, a sense of what was happening with the animals in that case. What we don't get much of a sense of is you know, any idea about those people and how they ended up in that situation. So who are animal, hold, animal hoarders? 
the stereotype is that of single older women living alone and socioeconomically disadvantaged. And reports in the literature do back that up and suggest that in many cases that is true. So these are some figures from one of the early North American studies of uh, 54 hoarders um, and subsequent studies have sort of largely, largely backed this up. In that case, 76% were females. The vast majority were um, over 40 years old um, and uh, nearly half were over 60 years old. Only 11% were under 40 years. 72% were single, divorced or widowed. 55% were in single-person households. And a quite a small number, only three households involved children and two had dependent elderly relatives. 26% of the hoarders subsequently were placed under guardianship, institutional care or supervised living. And that's very important because it reinforces that um, in, a, in a good quarter of those cases that these were very vulnerable adults um, who possibly or presumably lacked mental capacity to make decisions about their life and therefore needed this care afterwards. Um, despite the fact that that stereotype is, is largely true, there are many cases that, that don't fit that particular stereotype. And on the Hoarding of Animals Research Consortium website, they, they say this, which is, I think is really important to bear in mind. Hoarding knows no age, gender or socioeconomic boundaries. It has been observed in men and women, young and old, married as well as never married or widowed, and in people with professional or white-collar jobs. There have even been hoarders among human health professionals and veterinarians and veterinary technicians. It is not uncommon for hoarders to be secretive, living essentially a double life at work versus at home. So how does it overlap with other disorders? Uh, often people sort of think, oh, it's, you know, hoarding is a bit like OCD. And while there, there is some overlap with OCD, this is people who would sort of tend to um, compulsively hoard um, objects. The, the overlap with OCD is actually relatively small. Um, Animal hoarders essentially fall in this intersection between people who are compulsive hoarders, people who live with companion animals, and people who are living in extreme squalor. It's a multifaceted problem, and it develops for different reasons in different cases, and it's important to, to bear in mind that, well, um, when we do research, we can sort of look at, we can make generalizations across these groups, that every case is, is going to be slightly different. Um, a preliminary classification system has been developed by HARC, and this is largely based on their clinical experience. So they, 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 just, they, they say that uh, animal hoarders largely fall into sort of three broad categories. The first is the overwhelmed caregiver. These are people who have a very strong attachment to the animals who, who tend to see them as family members. Uh, this group, they have some awareness of the difficulties and they're more reality-based than the other subtypes. They tend to passively acquire animals, so they're more likely to have lots of animals because of uncontrolled breeding rather than because they've actively sought out these animals. The problems are often triggered by a change in circumstances and they're often found to be unable to problem solve effectively. This might be because they're more prone to um, Axis I disorders. So these are major psychiatric disorders like anxiety disorders, major depression, schizophrenia and so on. Um, they could have dementia. And they may lack mental capacity. They may need some form of guardianship. They're likely to be socially isolated. And their self-esteem tends to be linked to the role as the caregiver. I think that's very important to remember. They have fewer issues with authorities than the other groups. And they're more likely to allow an intervener to gain entry and to respect the system and comply with recommendations. Rescuer hoarders are the group who have a real sense of mission to go out and rescue animals. And this it leads to a compulsion to acquire animals. They fear death and tend to be opposed to euthanasia. They, they actively acquire animals and they strongly believe that they're the only one who can provide adequate care for those animals. It's off, the pattern is often that it's a rescued followed by adoption uh, sort of set up, which gradually becomes a rescue only care. So the number of animals gradually overwhelms their ability to provide care in those cases. They may have an extensive network of enablers, or it could actually be a group activity. So it's not, they're not necessarily socially isolated. They may be engaged in society, and perhaps because of that, may be less amenable to social services intervention. They tend to avoid authorities or impede their access. Exploiter hoarders are considered to be the group that are most difficult to deal with. So they tend to have sociopathic characteristics, which means they lack empathy for people or animals. They're indifferent to the harm that they're causing. They reject outsiders' concerns, and they, they may come across as superficially charming and, and charismatic. They may be articulate, skilled in giving excuses, and present the appearance of competence to the authorities. They lack guilt or remorse, and can be manipulative and cunning. 
um, being prepared to lie, cheat and steal to, to achieve their own ends, and they'll do that very instrumentally. Um, they may adopt the role of expert with an extreme need to control situations. They're likely to avoid authorities or impede their access, and they may have plans to beat the system so by doing things like dispersing animals to, to, uh, to friends if they think that they're under investigation. So the members of HARC say, you know, this is very useful typology. Um, the, the authors themselves say, however, that it's not definitive. There will be some overlap between types. Um, for example, at different times, a hoarder may exhibit features of more than one of these types. And it's based on the clinical experience of HARC members, but it's, as yet it's not been empirically tested or validated. Um, given those caveats, um, it's still probably useful to think about this in relation to interventions. So, because the, the way that you approach cases will depend on the, on the, you know, the type of person who's hoarding. So, overwhelmed caregivers, this is a group who may be most likely to be receptive to, to help in downsizing. Um, so, they, it may be possible to persuade some of those people and have a verbal agreement. The, the threat of future legal action might be sufficient to, to stop them from, you know, prevent them from starting to um, build up animals again. Um, prosecution in these cases is thought to be often unnecessary and may even be counterproductive. Rescuer hoarders um, are unlikely to be um, persuaded um, in, the, in the first, incident, uh, first um, stages. Um, however, because their motivation is to continue with rescue efforts, there may be some potential um, for a downscaled operation. So the, the, you know, if they're threatened with future legal action, it may be possible to have um, some, some sort of scope to negotiate with them and sort of come to some arrangement. Um, however, prosecution may be required if the hoarder fails to uh, adhere to any agreed-upon plan for animal care. Exploiter hoarders are the group who are most difficult to deal with, and it's thought in these cases that prosecution is probably the only viable option. So why do people hoard animals? A number of factors have been associated with hoarding. Um, they're often found to have a history of childhood trauma, including um, neglect and maltreatment. Um, there may be traumas in adult life. Um, and it's also associated with mental health disorders, so access one disorders like anxiety disorders, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, and so on. And access two disorders, which are the personality disorders. A developmental model has been proposed by HARC, um, and again, this is based on the clinical experience of the members, and, but hasn't been empirically validated. I think it's, it's a very useful starting point. So they highlight the, the fact that early childhood experiences, adverse experiences, seem to be present in the, the history um, of many hoarders. Um, and they specifically talk about neglectful abuse of an inconsistent parenting. So young children, um, for young children, it's essential to form a secure attachment to a primary caregiver. If this fails, they'll form a relationship with a secondary attachment figure. Um, it's been argued that uh, in, 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 in households with pets that there may be a reliance on a companion animal as a sort of secondary attachment figure, which buffers trauma of caregiver unavailability. So the pet can provide a predictable intimacy and security, but without the fear of rejection that they would have with their caregiver. Um, and it's been speculated whether this animal-child interaction, which is really in place of the animal-parent interaction, whether that becomes a template for all the future relationships. Um, disorganised attachment style is common in children who've been maltreated. Uh, they may develop a concept of their self as unlovable. They have a longing for intimacy, but concern about rejection and a fear of closeness. The child's internal model of caregivers is fragmented and incoherent, and this may, may predispose to personality disorders. Um, access to traits of the personality disorder traits and um, in hoarders, um, what's been observed is that they often have poor insight, emotional instability, impulsivity and chaotic internal and external lives. So this all leaves fertile soil, creates fertile soil for mental health problems. The human relationships that they form um, are then inadequate for buffering stressful life events or characterised by emotional pain, loneliness and fear of abandonment. Um, Contrast to this, animals provide unconditional love, acceptance, dependability and availability. And it's thought that these individuals may then sort of use those relationships with animals to reflect back a more desirable self-image. This then leads to a compulsive, excessive caregiving of animals. So in children with, who have disordered attachment, it can lead to a reorganisation of attachment behaviours into controlling strategies which are, are designed to maintain the involvement of others. And this, in the longer term, can lead to becoming addicted to caring for others. So 
this uh, compulsive caregiving can lead to a heightened sense of identity and self-esteem and control, which is sort of built around that image as a, a caregiver. Um, animals may be the solution for the person agonising over how to satisfy their longing for intimacy in the face of a paralysing fear of rejection and abandonment by humans. Indeed, by positioning him or herself as a rescuer, a hoarder may believe she's acquired a, a socially acceptable persona. Now, people may just continue on this cycle if nothing else happens, but if there's some sort of triggering event in adult life, which could be a loss of a stabilising adult relationship, a serious health crisis or a job loss, this is when the coping skills may be, and caregiving capacity may be overwhelmed, eventually leading to animal neglect and self-neglect. So what implications does this have for practice? So hoarding is essentially a symptom of mental health disorder. So it's not sufficient just to rely on removing animals in prosecution, as recidivism will, be, you know, will approach 100% otherwise, certainly according to US reports. You need a coordinated approach with other agencies, so social services, mental health services, and continued monitoring to reduce recidivism. Psychological and psychiatric assessment should form a part of a process. I've no idea how often that, that happens in practice. A significant minority of hoarders may lack mental capacity, and I think this is really important because if you're asking someone to consent to euthanasia or to signing over animals, then you know, it's, is, is it proper to do that if they don't really lack the capacity to make those types of decisions? And I do wonder if professionals working with animals should receive some sort of basic training in recognising and assessing mental capacity, as is required in other settings, for example, in research settings. Um, and I think really we need to systematically monitor and research animal hoarding in the UK, um, including the long-term outcomes. It's reassuring that the RSPCA have begun to do this, um, but that's just going to be the first step in really trying to, seeking to understand fully this behaviour in UK populations. So I will leave it to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona. That's very uh, interesting and certainly thought-provoking. And I'm sure most of us in, in general practice will recognise the, you know, the stereotypic, the, the cat lady. We, we were talking about it earlier on. And the real concern when you, when you know that they're not looking after their own welfare, never mind the, 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 the cats that they've got in the household. Um, so, quest questions on that? Plenty over here on the left, if you'd like to state your name. So you uh, Lorna Stevenson, veterinary officer, AH Villa in Cornwall. I um, appreciate that a lot of the work has not been done in this country, um, but I'd be very interested to see if you know what percentage of the hoarders are, I imagine the huge percentage would be small animals, but what percentage were actually farmed animals or, or non-small animals? Um, I don't know the exact percentages, actually. I mean, many of the, the, the problem with a lot of the research is that it's not necessarily sort of representative of, of all hoarders. It's often convenient samples, so it's sort of going to a particular area. So, like, the original cases were just cases in New York, so we're obviously going to be sort of cats and dogs and so on. Um, it definitely does occur in large animals, but I, I don't know the exact percentages. Mm. Um, Ethics and Welfare Group um, and Cambridge University. Um, a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for that. I have a, um, a problem when I come across people who are hoarding, but not at the extent that the animals are, are in, uh, having a welfare problem at the moment. And I, how do I get them uh, a psychiatric consult? I've got several people who I know. I mean, I'm a hoarder only of books and bow ties. But, um, but, um, <laughs> but, and, and people would say I have significant psychological problems. But, um, but, but, but if I've got somebody who I can see is going down that line, I need their consent to even talk to their GP. How, how do I go about getting that, or dealing with that situation? Yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. Uh, it's really difficult to know what to do in those cases. You know, if, if there's no animal suffering, if you can't, you know, if there's no, no sort of scope for, for prosecution, for example, then there's nothing that can really force that situation. Um, I mean, getting the person's consent to speak to a, a GP or, you know, find out if there's any sort of social services involvement in the, in the household may be a first step. I, I, sus I suspect that the, the thing that, that may be most useful um, may be sort of, 
finding, you know, identifying interested individuals in other organisations locally. You know, so if you know someone in social services, or you sort of make it your business to, to find someone who is interested in the human-animal relationship, for example, um, who might be interest, you know, might be susceptible to sort of having a chat about these things. That may be the first step is to sort of finding um, interested individuals in other organisations that could be an informal link and someone that you could discuss cases with, even if you don't, in the first instance, don't necessarily sort of, um, uh, you know, disclose who you're talking about, but just to sort of get advice um, and sort of take it from there. But there's no, there's no easy way to deal with that. You know, if, if someone is, is not at the stage that they're, it, it's causing real problems, you can see that it might be like that in the future, but it's not already at that stage, then it's very difficult to, to force that, really, unless Thanks they're susceptible to, to some sort of intervention. Thanks very much. Question here. Um, Society for Companion Animal Studies and the BVA AWF representative for Scotland. Um, the point that I want to make is what you've just raised. I think that vets in practice should endeavour to have a social worker that they can talk to on an informal basis. Um, there's other situations where you really need social work advice and input on how to manage cases, especially involving people with companion animals. So instances where you might suspect child abuse, elder abuse, um, child neglect, these situations of people potentially becoming hoarders. If you've got a social worker who might be one of your clients who's interested in the bond that you can talk to informally, you don't need to give um, client personal details, you just discuss the situation, they can then advise you what course to take. Um, the veterinary schools in the States, a number of them now have social work departments within the vet schools, and I think that's something that we should have here. I think that vet students should receive some training from social workers during the undergraduate course, and that we should learn to work not just with social workers, but with people from the other health and social care professions within the community, develop a multidisciplinary professional network that we can call upon. And I think that some of the reasons that vets are so stressed and that we have a high incidence of mental health problems, alcoholism and suicide, is that we don't have this network. We take on too much. We need to know when to refer situations to people in the other health and social care professions, of which we're an important part. I think that's a really good point, actually, because you do, I think it's very true, actually, that vets, you feel that you have to deal not just with the pet, but all the, you know, the problems that the, the owner comes in with as well. And, of course, vets are not trained to, to, to deal with those sorts of things and don't feel equipped to... Yes. And we, yeah. need to, we also should have a list of agencies that we can refer clients to themselves... Mm -hmm as well as know when to reach out to the other professions to get help for individuals. Yeah. Again, I don't wish to put anybody on the spot, but I can because I'm sitting here. And Frida, is this something that can be taken forward with links and medics against violence that we're hearing a lot about? Uh, Frida Scott Park, chairman of the Links Group in this particular capacity. Um, Lynx has always advocated this, as um, Liz in fact well knows, because she um, co-presents to vet students with Paula Boyden, who does the, you know, the, um, the training of, you know, sort of animal abuse and the link to, you know, sort of problems in a violent household. Um, we are making good progress talking to our multi-agency colleagues through the Lynx group, and I'm sure Liz will know that. Um, there is a certain, there has been a certain inertia over the last 10 years, but that's changing substantially as, if I could put the humans, the human, you know, healthcare workers are becoming overwhelmed with problems, both on just the human side, but also they're suddenly beginning to realise that in a, a, a large number of households, there are animals involved as well. And I don't, I, I don't even want to mention the sort of signposting of what can go on, you know, with the abuse of the animals leading to abuse, further abuse within the household to humans. But um, we're getting more and more interest in the links group, you know, with people coming in to talk to us and trying to sort of saying we really want to get involved. And we've made 
great progress and you'll probably be aware that the Animal Welfare Foundation has taken a huge interest in this area and I'm currently working with the Lynx Group, Medics Against Violence and uh, Animal Welfare Foundation to provide some really useful training materials for vets supported. We're terribly grateful to the Margaret Giffen Trust for supporting this initiative. It's quite complicated because it is multi-agency but we're getting there. And Thanks for that. And where, and where does it fit? Anybody from Royal College? I mean, we, we know if we've got a patient coming in where our obligations lie on confidentiality, but just going that step further with, with the actual owner and recognising, where, where does that fit? Is there an issue there? Neil? Uh, I couldn't quote the uh, exact wording in the, in the, in the um, code and the supporting guidance, but there is, there is mention made in there about... Uh, about at least under the section on confidentiality, uh, and the uh, that uh, code and the supporting guidance that goes with it is available as a downloadable app for uh, for both um, um, iPhones and Androids, but not Blackberries. Uh, but no, there is it's something we've recognised, and you, it is a situation where it is acceptable to breach confident confidentiality. And of course, you can all, in certain circumstances, and of course, you can always refer to professional conduct department if you need yeah. additional support uh, or, or guidance on that. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, question over here. Thank you. I'm, it's a very fascinating talk. Uh, Stephen Lister, in fact, a poultry vet. From a psychiatric point of view, um, how devastating or damaging it is to these type of people who have a perverse view of caring to actually prosecute them for animal cruelty? Because presumably most are going to come to light through RSPCA or local authorities who are on a bound, presumably, to, to take prosecutions. Is that, is that going to, as you say, there's, there, there are going to be repeat offenders, but is, it, is this going to be the best way to handling, or is this a justifiable reason for, for leniency? And I, I think it probably depends on the, the individual and the types of problems they've got. So um, I can imagine if someone does have a, a, a sort of significant psychiatric disorder, if it's someone who has major depression or is, you know, has schizophrenia and is sort of paranoid and delusional, for example, then I, I can well imagine that um, prosecution could make them an awful lot worse, which could then ex you know, essentially sort of exacerbate the problem. Um, but there will be other people who prosecution will be the only way to deal with it. So I think this is why it's, it's important to understand the, the type of person that you're dealing with. And of course, given, you know, sort of going back to this problem, that given that it's largely animal welfare groups who are dealing with these sorts of cases, there's no expertise or, or no way of you know, really sort of knowing that other than just the, you know, the sort of gut instinct of the person investigating. Um, and this is why I think, you know, really when you know, someone like the RSPCA are investigating these cases that there needs to be some sort of involvement of, of other agencies um, at the outset, I would imagine, to really get a much better picture of the type of problems that that person has. You know, if it is someone with a, an undiagnosed um, psychiatric disorder, then they, they really need referral for, for treatment. Um, but I, I just have no idea. I mean, because there's, there's no reports in this country, I, I don't know if that happens to any any extent. Um, but I, I think that's a really essential part of the process, just to know who you're dealing with, what their problems are, and what the likely outcome would be of, of different courses of action. I agree, because most, most reporting you see of these cases, of, you know, it's, a big, it's a big headline that these are cruel people who've yeah. done this and yeah. they should be run out of town. Sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And if, if it is someone who is you know, genuinely a sort of overwhelmed caregiver, then I can imagine that would be very devastating you know, to be in the, across the papers as someone who's caused this horrendous cruelty. Um, you know, I, I imagine it would be horrendous for those individuals. Yeah. Okay, well, should exercise presidential prerogative, Robin. Hi. Uh, yeah, Robin Hargreaves, uh, BBA, um, but speaking as a general practitioner, I, I, it's been absolutely enlightening as this, and I've seen over the 27 or 8 years that I've worked in the current practice that I'm in, serial people come into the practice and begin sort of um, self-motivated rescue organisations that have ultimately run into difficulty. Usually the problem arises because it turns into a bad debt. It's because people just, they run away from, they have no notion how they're going to do the fundraising, but they do know how they're going to rescue the animals. So they, they start a nominal charity, they rescue hundreds of animals and they start bringing things in for treatment. And, they're, and, they're, and because we're sympathetic and we like them and they're friendly and they're nice, we, we let them go so far. And then the debt just gets out of hand and you end up with this awful situation where you're, in a, you're falling out with somebody who's essentially well-motivated and nice because they're just simply cannot keep up with trying to, they want you to do it and they can't understand why you won't do it for no payment. Um, and I, I'll have a different, perhaps a different 
approach this when it happens the next time, because it will happen again. That you and I do even now. I've said, you know, do you understand where this is going? Because I do. I've seen this before, but I've never known quite how to address it. But the other thing I would say is that, that our prisons and our streets are full of people with poorly addressed mental health issues, who ha have come across. Um, an, in, an inflexible legal system, um, and I think there's an opportunity here for us, in conjunction with our res with our, with our welfare organisations, the RSPCA in particular, to perhaps try and be a little bit more sympathetic to this group of people. But it, I do see that perhaps prosecution is too often the blunt instrument for these cases, and it is. I mean, it, the static, statistics are clear; it doesn't work. So we, perhaps we should have a primary focus on doing something else. Carrot rather than the stick. There was a lady here. Just had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, sorry, Jackie Patterson, um, northeast of England representative for the AWF. I was going to comment on the Royal College uh, confidentiality issue, um, but Robin's probably raised a few more points I'd like to comment on. I do a lot of prosecution with the RSPCA. I deal with a lot of animal hoarders. Um, one of the animal hoarders currently reported me to the Royal College uh, for daring to um, make any comment on her because my practice had treated some of her cats. Uh, the Royal College uh, very encouragingly dealt with that complaint very quickly and uh, our primary obligation is to the welfare of animals. And I think, just to come back on Robin, um, I would disagree that these rescue people are well motivated my experience of them is that they are actually very manipulative. I don't know how that fits into the, the psychology you've been discussing. And they come across as very well-meaning, but actually if you try and help them and try and address the problem, you will find they will just, um, they will tell you to your face that they're doing it, but you will actually discover they're doing something totally different. Um, and I, I, I think we need, to, as veterinary surgeons, our first priority has to be to the welfare of the animals. I appreciate there is a welfare aspect to the humans as well, but I do think we have to concentrate on the, in these cases on the, the welfare of the animal uh, primarily and get these people uh, banned from keeping animals, as I believe it's the only answer to preventing the animal welfare issues. One thing I would say, I mean, that the, there are obviously lots of different types of people who, who end up hoarding animals, so that sort of typology sort of demonstrates. I think probably what you're talking about is more that, that type described as the exploiter hoarder who are you know, sociopathic characteristics who may be very, very manipulative. So there will definitely be people like that, and, and obviously prosecution in those cases is probably the only way to deal with it, but there will be other people who don't really fit those, those characteristics, and I think that's why it's important to sort of differentiate and establish what exactly is going on, which is not necessarily the job of vets, obviously, you know, that, that's where you need to work with other agencies. Um, but the, I think the, the concern with just focusing on the animal welfare aspect and on prosecution is that we, we, we don't know, um, you know, what the long-term outcomes are, but the chances are that person will start again at some point. And I'd be interested to know, actually, when people, when people like that are banned from keeping animals, to what extent it's monitored and to what extent you know, those people do just start again at some point, perhaps by moving area where no one knows them um, and just start up again. Because if that's the case, then that approach is not really working. Um, it's only now that the RSPCA are starting to monitor these cases that hopefully we'll get a better picture of how often that happens. Adi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really fascinating talk. Adi Nell from Medivet, Small Animal um, Practice. I think most of us would recognise that there are two issues here. First of all, there's the animal welfare issue, and I think most vets would report that to the RSPCA and try to get the animals looked after as best they can. If we're going to try to address the human mental health side of it and contact social services, how well do they recognise these issues? If I phoned up my you know, social services in Oxford and said there was someone I was concerned about uh, who was hoarding animals, what kind of response might I get? And if that response isn't what I'd hope for, is there some way of escalating that further? Yeah. I don't know. I, I imagine it's probably potluck as to who you speak to and what their interest in, is in these types of cases. Um, you know, and again, because there's been so little in the in the literature, you know, social work literature, medical literature, and so on, until until quite recently, and there's still very very little out there. So it's it's highly likely that many professionals working in social services or you know, doctors and so on are actually pretty unaware of these problems as well. So I imagine it really is luck, depending on who you speak to. Um, I don't know about escalating that. Actually, I don't know if anyone here who's got more experience 
experience of sort of working in practice with cases like this um, has any idea about what you do if you, if you don't get a sort of sympathetic or interested response? Is it, I don't know, it'd be I good to difficult. know if anyone else um, has got any, got any thoughts about that. Trying to get hold of a social yeah. worker full stop is, yeah. is pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, trying to get one for yeah. a member of the family, you've just got to keep at them and you've mm -hmm. just got to keep trying. Um, so yeah. you've just got to keep going, but we do need to be signposted in the right direction to begin with. Andrew, you had a question, but I know you haven't got a microscope. With a case recently, 80 thoroughbred horses, 125 dogs, and 65 pigs, all with an older couple looking after them. Access was gained by the local authority with me there as a welfare advisor because they were obviously, these dogs were breeding and they were selling puppies and they didn't conform with the licensing authorities. If you have more than five breeding bitches, then you need a license. That's how access was gained. I gave my advice. In fact, all they had industrial feed uh, for the dogs. They had huge mincers, cookers. Um, none of the horses were neglected. I found two pigs, and they were all living in a large community that were perhaps rather runty and uh, undernourished. But the problem I'm now faced with, I've given my advice, but should I, when I gave my advice, have taken a step further and said to the local authority, above and beyond my veterinary welfare duty that uh, I advise that these, anim these people who are getting on and were beginning to lose the battle simply because of age, they needed help. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a duty that a veterinary surgeon involved in these situations should have? I think, yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I, I mean, I, I remember I've, I've not uh, dealt with hoarding uh, I, I was in a practice for a relatively short period of time before I went into academia. Um, I've not de I don't remember dealing with hoarding cases as such, but certainly other cases where there was adults that I felt to be at risk. And it's a real dilemma, you know, I sort of look back, and because at the time I didn't know what to do with those cases, you know, elderly people who obviously were living in squalor are very unable to look after themselves, let alone the pets. Um, at the time, we didn't know what to do with that. You know, they were just, we just got on with treating the animals and tried to be sympathetic and so on. But yeah, looking back, I sort of think, should I have followed up those cases? Should I have felt a duty? Um, and maybe, as, as Liz said, you know, maybe we would all be less stressed about those sorts of cases and about, you know, sort of dealing with these things if we did follow up actively and actually at least make some attempt to contact social services or another agency and sort of make that case. Yeah. I think sometimes as well, it becomes not so much a duty as a veterinary surgeon, it's a duty as a fellow human being, isn't it? And, and you know, and that's the difficulty in here. I've got one more question at the back and then I'm going to have to wrap um, this. Matthew Erskine, Edinburgh Vet Student again. Um, you, like, one of the characteristics of these hoarders is kind of the compulsion to care, but more and more we see dogs and things and cats coming into practices that are chronically obese. And these owners also seem to have a compulsion to care and feed for their pet. And I was wondering if you think there's some sort of overlap in that, especially considering that the welfare and health implications of the beast pet is possibly more significant um, than the underfed dog or something like that? Or is this just a wider breakdown in the human-animal bond in Western society? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I've showed the diagram that sort of showed the overlap between various different sort of syndromes and conditions, and that there are almost certainly people who have that compulsion, compuls, compulsion to care, um, but who don't hoard animals, but, but you know, nevertheless um, don't recognise when what they're doing is causing problems in the animals. So there's, there's almost certainly, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not aware of research in that area, but there are almost certainly individuals that fall into to that sort of pattern as well. Good. Well, Fiona, thank you very much. That's really thought-provoking. I mean, it's, we, we, we're getting right to the line on these questions, and I think it's just indicative of the quality of the presentations we're having. So thank you very much.